Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. If you're physically able, I'd invite you to stand with me. As we read today from Matthew's gospel account concerning the birth of Jesus. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Father, this is good news. A Savior was born. And yet, Father, we live in a world that is filled with bad news. And at times, it just seems to be getting worse and worse. We should not be surprised. For the New Testament tells us that evil will grow worse and worse. Father, we see it globally. We see it between nations. We see it within our own nation in conflicts and politics and conflicts between groups of people. And we experience it ourselves sometimes with conflicts in our individual relationships. Father, I would ask today that as your gospel is preached globally and locally, that the good news of Jesus Christ would go forth with power by your Spirit to the saving of souls, to the reconciling of men and women with God and with one another. Empower your gospel around the world and here locally. We're thankful for gospel churches in Columbia County and among them today, we pray. We pray for College View and their pastor, Brother Paul Bullock, that you would empower your word there. And in the next few moments here in this room and through the media platforms that we have, speak to us. May we hear. May we obey. May we be at peace. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You know how it is. The Christmas season, like any other season of the year, can be filled with both joy and joy. And sorrow, with glad greetings and really nervous reunions with with some folk. I mean, we've all got the crazy cousin Eddie, right? (laughs) And maybe you have that disgruntled ex, and there's a fight over where the kids go at Christmas. Or maybe you have that son or daughter who's become estranged to you. They have maybe gone off into sin and turned their back on their family. Or maybe it's the parent who now has Alzheimer's and dementia and is really inconsolable and uncontrollable. Whatever it is, all of this serves to elevate our stress at any time of the year, and particularly, it seems, at Christmas. And and on top of that, I mean, the year's end tends to increase our stress because we think back on the past year, what it was like, The things that we did and didn't do, successes and failures, and all of that can lead to a lot of regret. You know, kind of like the guy who said, you know, in January, I began the year with a resolution to lose 10 pounds, and now it's December, and I've only got 20 to go. (laughs) We can all feel this way. We can find ourselves pondering this time of year, all kinds of 
difficult problems and seemingly unanswerable questions in our lives, in our families, in our world. What do we do about these relationships in our life in general? What, what does God want us to do? And even if we know what He wants us to do, how do we do that? And to all those kinds of questions, I just simply say, welcome to the Christmas conundrum, as I call it today. Now, Cindy and I started dating in, in the fall of 1985. Seems like a lifetime ago. I asked her out and showed up to take her out, and she had an entourage of friends waiting. She sent me a, a, a cartoon the other day of, of you know, Christmas bulbs, you know, those bulbs like on a tree or outside. And it was this guy bulb, and he had come up to the door, and, and, and the girl bulb he is taking out had come out to meet him. And there were all these other Christmas girl bulbs around her. And he's like, what's going on? And she said, well, we're Christmas bulbs. If one goes out, they all go out. <laughs> yeah. Those of you who remember pre-LED days know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, there she was with all these girls. I don't know if she didn't trust me or what. But lo and behold, you know what? By December, we had rings on layaway at the service merchandise. Any of you remember the service merchandise? We paid them out without anybody knowing. And in the spring, I think it was, we got formally engaged. And in December of 86, we were married and have been married now 32 years and a couple of days. It all turned out okay. Betrothal, or engagement as we call it today, was similar in Bible times, but at the same time it was quite different. Engagement in Bible times involved a commitment made between the two in front of witnesses, and it was a contractual agreement. The intention was pledged and written down. It carried the legal expectations of marriage without the physical side of it. The physical side of it would be the consummation of the marriage when the wedding itself actually happened, which could be as much as a year out or so from the contract of engagement. And as shocking as it is, if someone calls off an engagement today, not only was it shocking then, it was also a breach of contract. It was a betrayal of a contract. And if your fiancé turned up pregnant, not only was it a breach of the contract, it was a breach of God's law, and the law of God imposed a death penalty upon one who would so breach that contract. That was Joseph's conundrum. Joseph, as you read this text, or as it begins, he did not know about Luke 1. <laughs> he did not know about his fiance Mary carrying the Son of God. All he knew was what he heard when her pregnancy became evident. Somebody sent word or came and told him, Joseph, your fiance Mary is pregnant. Joseph's response to both the news of Mary's pregnancy, which he knew he was not a part of, and then eventually to the angelic explanation that will come his way, reveals much about the kind of man Joseph was and is instructive to us when we find ourselves in any of life's many relational conundrums. And the first thing that we can learn from him is this. In such a conundrum, we must do what is right with kindness. Do what is right with kindness. Dr. Ligon Duncan wrote this that I read recently in one of my daily Advent devotions. There are many who are righteous, but who are not kind. 
There are many who are kind, but who are not righteous. Joseph, however, he said, loved God and his law, and that love of God touched his heart, causing him to be a kind man. When God chose a human father for his son, he chose a man who would be righteous and kind, qualities that reflect God the Father himself. Well said about Joseph. Joseph is, in the text, a just man. He is a righteous man. Hearing that his fiance has betrayed his trust, he resolves to divorce her, to take the option that the law legally, rightly, and justly gives him, but he will do this quietly. Now, while people were not being stoned to death in Joseph's day for such breach of contracts and breaches of God's law, he still could have chosen to out her and to publicly shame her. He could have had a full-blown Facebook moment. But instead, he is kind. Joseph reminds us that regardless of the relational conundrum, a love betrayal, a broken friendship, a workplace knife in the back, a church conflict, or a political impasse, or any other kind of relational conundrum that we face in life, we can do what is right with kindness. When our affections are set on God and His law, we will live in all of His righteousness and in all of His kindness expressed to us in spite of our own many betrayals of His law and His love. And that all of Him will both strengthen our righteous resolve and soften our hearts with kindness. Righteousness and kindness are not at odds with one another. They are simultaneous byproducts of a healthy view of God. Joseph teaches us to do what is right with kindness. And secondly, he teaches us to do what God says. Finally, an angel shows up. Don't know how long it was from the time that he heard about Mary and the angel shows up, but even if it was 30 minutes, that surely felt like an eternity. Finally, an angel shows up to let Joseph know about what's going on. That which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, the angel says. Now, I I don't know that Joseph would have believed that line from Mary herself. He may have. He's no doubt a, a better man than I am, but What we do know is that Joseph, once he hears that his fiance is pregnant, was seeking direction from God before the angel appeared. Scripture says he was considering these things. He was meditating on what he was heard. He was pondering what he was going to do. He was giving tremendous consideration and prayer to the conundrum that he faced. Matthew Henry once wrote, the Lord gives guidance to the thoughtful, not to the unthinking. (laughs) I like that. And what does Joseph do? Well, when the angel tells him what he is to do, Joseph does exactly what the Lord commanded him to do. He was fully obedient. He takes Mary as his wife. He identifies with her in her shame. He takes on her stigma. Caring for her as she carries the Son of God. He names the baby Jesus. He gives the Son of God a home. He gives him a family on earth. Sounds easy enough, right? But it never is. Because here's the thing. We all have those moments of decision. God's will is clear to us. It's been revealed through His Word. We have discerned it through prayer. We are convinced convinced of God's leadership. But we also know, as with Joseph, it will cost 
us something. In that moment when we realize that, our breathing shallows, our heart flutters, and our palms begin to sweat. It's interesting when the angel came, the angel called him Joseph, son of David. Joseph, he reminds him, you are of a royal lineage, a covenant lineage. And this is your time. This is your place in that lineage. This is your moment. So, Joseph, trust the God who has brought you to this place in this moment. Now listen to me, dear friend. When you find yourself meditating in your moment of decision, pondering, considering the conundrum, realizing God's clear will in your life, yet fearful of what that may cost you, remember who you are. A child of God in Christ Jesus. This is your time. This is your place in His kingdom. Trust the God who has brought you to this moment in this place and do what He requires of you to do. Do what is right and do it with kindness. How do we do that? How we do that, how we fulfill that, how we are sustained in that is with the Christmas message (laughs) itself. And what is the Christmas message in this text? There are two big things you see about the Christmas message. The first one is this. God is with us. Now, Joseph was a carpenter, was he not? He's not a scribe. He is not a theologian by trade. But no doubt, he knew verse 23 before it was verse 23. You say, what do you mean? Well, he could have quoted, no doubt, with the angel, what the angel is quoting, which is Isaiah 7, 14. This is a prophecy of old. He knew the promise of Emmanuel, God with us. And no doubt, Joseph is one of those who has been longing for that promise to become reality. Come thou long expected Jesus has been the yearning of his heart. And now... And now God was with him, literally growing in Mary's womb. He, Joseph, would help her to Bethlehem. He would comfort her in the stable. He would help deliver her, delivering God in flesh. He would help her wrap the baby in the swaddling claws. This hope was being fulfilled in his presence. And that hope was without a doubt Joseph's strength. It was what sustained him. A Savior is born. God is with us. This hope fulfilled in the first advent. This hope that we are waiting for with great anticipation to be culminated in the second advent is today our strength of purpose. God, ladies and gentlemen, is with us. Christ left, but he sent his spirit to us as he promised. He has not left us as orphans in this world. We are not alone. However lonely in this world way we may appear or at times even feel to be. Ladies and gentlemen, God is with us. And He is with us because the Savior is born. She will bear a son, and you shall call His name Jesus, 
for he will save his people from their sins. You, the angel says, will call his name Jesus. It was in that culture the father's responsibility to officially pronounce the name of the child. And so when Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, Joseph would stand in, in the place of the father who is in heaven, to name the holy child Jesus, Savior. Now, he can only be the stand-in for the Father who is in heaven because he himself, Joseph, is one of the people to be saved, delivered from his sins by the child he helps Mary deliver into the world. Joseph will deliver the one who will deliver him. The one who will deliver us. The one who will deliver all who call upon his name. He will save his people from their sins is the gospel. The cross looms for Jesus even while he is in utero. And for our deliverance, Jesus must live the perfect life that you and I and all of humanity has miserably failed to live. He did. He must die to pay the penalty for all of our sins. He did. He must be raised from the dead to conquer the enemy and to guarantee us life eternal. He did. He must ascend into the heaven to present himself as the atoning sacrifice before the Father and there to hear our repentant prayers and to mediate on our behalf as our high priest. Ladies and gentlemen, he is. This is the gospel. And some of us, maybe this morning, many of us in this room or beyond who are listening or watching are at a moment of decision. God is calling and we must and we will respond. The question then is how will you respond? Are you struggling in one of those relationship conundrums? Trying to decide between righteousness and kindness? Ladies and gentlemen, choose both. Are you meditating, pondering, considering a decision? Maybe you already know this is what the right thing is to do, but you're fearful of what will happen if you obey God's Word, if you keep His commandment, if you do what He says. Child of the Most High. Do you hear me? Child of the Most High God. Trust the God who has delivered you from sins through His Son Trust the God who has brought you to this moment, in this place, in this time, and do what He bids you to do. Obey His Word. Searching for the strength of of, of purpose to do all of that? I tell you this morning, God is with us. God is with you. You are not alone. We are not sustained by our gritted teeth determination, but by the hope of Christ through faith in Christ filling us with the love of Christ. Weary of sin's foul bondage, Jesus came to deliver you. 
however foul your bondage is. Trust who he is and trust all that he, in his life and his death and his resurrection, and even now as he has ascended to heaven, trust all that he has done, all that he is doing, all that he will do for you. Call up on his name now. Cry out to him, your lips to his ear, your hurt to his heart. Call out to God, confessing that Jesus is Lord and that you believe that he has been raised from the dead is the Savior of mankind, and that you personally trust in Him. And you will be saved. In just a moment, we will worship. And when we do, the pastors are going to join me here at the front. This altar is going to be open for prayer. If this is your moment, I plead with you upon the mercies of Christ. Do not let it pass. Would you bow your heads with me? If God is calling you to Himself out of your sins, will you right now in this very moment Cry out to Him. Your words. Cry out to Him. Right now. Confess who He is, what you're not. Believe in your heart. Whether you're in this room or watching through video or listening via radio, will you right now, just wherever you are, will you Call upon the name of the Lord. Now, if you have done that, I want to encourage you. Let somebody know. Maybe the Lord, if you're in this room, would lead your heart just to come forward and take up one of these pastors by the hand and say, I've just trusted Christ. That pastor will rejoice with you. He'll pray with you. And we'd love to begin a relationship with you as a part of the family of God. The next step in obedience is baptism, just as we saw with Jonathan this morning. Maybe you've been saved and you've never taken that step. Would you step out? This is your moment. Would you respond to God's call upon your life to identify with Him? Maybe you're wanting to become part of this church be happy to talk with you. Maybe you just need to come and pray at this altar. Maybe it's a family conundrum. Maybe there are issues in your life and you just feel the need to come and to kneel as we worship and just talk to God. This is your moment. Father, thank you for the wonderful Christmas narrative. Thank you that Jesus came and that God is with us in Christ by His Spirit even today. Thank you that Jesus delivers from sin. And oh Father, we pray that even now in this moment that there are those in this room or beyond who are calling out to you in Christ's name confessing that He is Lord and believing in all that He has done for them. And Father, wherever we find ourselves today, as we face the moments of decision, may we, from the gospel itself, find the courage as the children of the Most High God to rise up and to trust and to obey, regardless of what the cost may be, knowing how much we are loved and how much we have been forgiven. Let us give ourselves fully to your will for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Will you stand? Will you worship? Will you come?